We're going to start this week, of course, with the sad news about Sabine Schmitz, who uh, died last week. Uh, She was 51. So young. Um, She'd been ill for a while, I gather, but not that that makes it any less sad what happened. Complete, complete shock. I didn't even know that she had been unwell. Um, Yeah, it's, it's difficult to say anything worthwhile that hasn't already been said but but the outpouring from people uh, of of sheer respect in it, especially in a world dominated by men i suppose in, in motorsport she just was amazing a clear talent behind the wheel i mean winning the 24 hour race at the nürburgring twice um still the only woman to have ever done that um, and always smiling. I think every single press picture you see of her, or um, and when you see her presenting on Top Gear, and that was the first time I saw her. Like so many people, first time I saw her was 2004 in Top Gear when she just destroyed Clarkson uh, <laughs> uh, by driving a transit van around the, the green hell. So yeah, and I mean that's that's I knew to be a little bit from working with her on Top Gear and. She was a um, remarkable person, just a force of nature, the sort of sheer ball of freewheeling energy that she brought to everything, and consistently so as well. I mean, because uh, when we were doing Top Gear, even in the early days, I think the show was sort of predominantly about the three presenters, and occasionally other people would kind of come into our self-created world. Uh, but it would usually be for a specific thing and they wouldn't really leave a lasting effect and the one exception to that was Sabine and when she did that piece coaching Jeremy around the Nürburgring um, it was pretty clear that she was something special and she had this charisma on camera and off it and it's also rare that a contributor which is what she was you know we didn't expect too much from her because she's not at that point she you know she wasn't she wasn't hired as a presenter she was just a contributor to the show and and sometimes contributors they just do their job and they quietly go away but she sort of owned that whole scene and and also brilliantly kind of came up with the editorial for a follow-up film when she said i'll tell you something i'll do that lap time in a van um you know that's the kind of stuff that as tv producers you just which would happen more often. Um, so it was such an incredible shock. Uh, yeah, so sad times. Um, very sad times for all of us who worked on Top Gear in that era, um, because she was unique. Um, I think if you're going to leave this earth with anything, leave it with some decent um, memories. Yeah, if there is an afterlife, some people are getting some really good passenger rides right now, um, and also. On a rather downbeat note, we have to talk, of course, about um, Murray Walker, who mm. died um, just after we'd recorded the last podcast, which is why he wasn't mentioned last week. Um, and um, so I know it sounds a bit name dropping because I also worked with Murray Walker a few times on different things. And um, it was strange because he was 97 uh, and I worked it out. I think I first worked with him in the early 2000s and I suddenly realised that that meant he was already in his late 70s and he still was absolutely on point his memory and his analytical ability and his contributions to scripts that we worked on were absolutely pin sharp wow and you know physically in those days even though he wasn't a young man he was incredibly lively and there's something i think that's quite interesting that that probably Murray Walker and Sabine Schmitz have in common which is that there is a sort of energy to them and it's an energy that manifests itself in an absolute passion for something and which is just compelling and almost intoxicating when you spend time in their company or you see them through the lens of television and and Murray Walker definitely had that for for Formula One. Mm. One of the things that I remember him saying once was there's no such thing as a boring F1 race. Really? And I went, yeah. And I was like, really? Because sometimes, and he was like, well, no, I hear people say that a lot, and I have to disagree. For me, there's no such thing as a boring F1 race because there's always something going on. You may be just not seeing it at the time. And um, 
and I know what he meant. I mean, mm. I think sometimes you do have to look quite hard, but I was like, that's someone who's really committed, really immersed in it. And he was. And I also remembered uh, we did a TV show, um, a studio show, and he was a guest on it. And he was brilliant and he played along and he was really good fun. And then afterwards, there was a bar at the studio and we went to the bar and someone said, Murray, would you like to come for a quick drink in the bar? And he went, oh, yeah, that'd be, that'd be nice. And and he came and he had a car waiting outside to take him home. And he lived in the New Forest, so it's quite far from where we were filming in London. So he had a sort of couple of hour journey ahead of him. And it was already getting late, but he got a glass of red wine and then he just stood and he just chatted F1 with us for like an hour or so did he just because yeah it was me and as a, a mutual friend of ours jim who you know who's really into f1 and jim and i just stood there and we just talked to murray walker about formula one and we were happy as anything and he's just he just liked to chat about about the sport he's just into it yeah it was and, and he's there standing in his comfy car a glass of red i mean you'd think that after a while be like, everywhere i go people want to talk to me about formula bloody one but no, I think he he loved it so deeply that it was just the same as there was never a boring F1 race. There was never a boring F1 conversation for him. He just he he loved it. That's that's remarkable. Did you ever meet him? No, I don't think I ever did. I, I've I've stood like next to him, uh, not in a creepy way, <laughs> and um, but, and I've and I've I've seen him do public speaking and, and interviews and things he i think he was always just a fascinating person but um because i suppose when someone is really really so passionate about something whatever that thing is it it's infectious isn't it yeah which is why i think it's such a skill to have um especially when you're trying to educate or kind of entertain people but yeah i think he, he was definitely one of the greats I, I still can't believe he was that old actually i mean that is I know, he sort of hasn't aged over the last 30 years. He kind of got into his maybe mid-70s and then just kind of pressed the pause button, didn't he? And um, Yeah, that's it. I think that happens, doesn't it? You just become sort of an old man. But, but at the same time, like I said, he was not, you know, he was not a frail old man. That's the other thing. So, so he sort of stood there for, a, for an hour just chatting in a TV studio bar we were standing. We weren't sitting down. We stood there. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's just mm. like, actually, there's a lot of men, and this would have been about uh, 18 years ago now. But even so, so that's, he's, for the sake of argument, he was 79. There's a lot of 79-year-olds wouldn't stand for an hour just chatting. Cause, it's true, you know, actually. We all get a bit, a bit... Well, Sterling Moss famously used to carry his, his stool around, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. His walking exactly. stick stool thing that was foldable. Um, Funny enough, I mentioned it to my wife as well. And she worked with him separately. And uh, and she went, oh, oh, Murray, he was lovely. And I said, I'm glad you thought he was lovely as well. And she went, yeah, he always used to, when we were working with him, he always used to go around. If he was leaving, he'd always go around and go, okay. And he'd go and say goodbye to everyone. And he'd be like, don't work too hard. I hope you're not going to be here too late. And he'd, he'd always give them a little sort of like, no, you, like you, a chivvy you, along. you go home. You should go home. Yeah. That's, it's yeah, very. So they all loved him on her team. And um, so, yeah, I was very saddened by it. And also just because of something you just said as well about, you know, great communicators and I sort of thought Murray Walker was the sound of my childhood or part of it he was one of those voices that not just entertained but also told you stuff that was interesting so he's up there yeah. with Attenborough as a voice and John Craven would be another example or Floella Benjamin even yeah. you know, someone who's sort of telling you stuff that's educating you but keeping you amused as well when you're when you're at a very formative age and that's hugely important, and it stays with you as well. So I think that's partly what what made me so sad about Murray Walker yeah. passing is that he was some um, he was someone who told you stuff, educated you, expanded your brain. No, he was he was, he was very good, and um I, I, and weirdly, just before Christmas when I did a um a, an interview with Jason Plato and Matt Neal, I had to go through loads of yeah. old archive touring car clips just to try and find some information do some research and of course a lot of the 90s super touring era especially that i was mm. i was watching all um commentated by murray or a lot of it and it's so exciting as soon as you hear his excitement you're excited even he he could have yeah. been I know, he could be talking you through how he's going to put the potato peelings in the bin yeah uh, but you'd still be like yeah i'm, I'm with you i'm with you on this I, I'm, I'm feeling it there's energy here it's great did you feel, I, I sort of felt like Murray Walker's voice was a bit like uh, a racing engine. 
because if you ask someone to do an impression of Murray Walker, they do 18,000 revs, Murray Walker. They do. Hey, hey, go, hey, go, hey, go, hey, go, 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 and that's, that's the sort of default Murray Walker impression. But I liked it low down, almost just above idle, a bit lumpy Murray, which he would, you know, <laughs> to, be, to be talking quite seriously, just over some, you know, the sort of general helicopter shots of the track before anything interesting starts going yes. on. Well, it's the calm, uh, it's the calm before the storm, too. Murray, yeah, isn't it? And uh, of course, yeah, and it's just very sort of, it's not monotone, but it's much flatter, but it has little lumps in it, and it's just, and it's the calm, yeah, it's the calm before the storm. Is it ca- you know Cammy, coming. Cammy Murray? Cammy, it is, yeah. isn't it? I think, maybe he'd got switchable cams I, in, in his vocal delivery. I think he had uh, switchable vocal cord cam shafts that he didn't... Because his low, quiet sort of nothing much is going on voice was was much deeper than the yeah everything's kicking off sound so yeah he, he i think he had a long relationship point, possibly with honda uh he could have been the yeah. inspiration for the vtec system uh do you know something else about murray walker that is is sort of less reported and wasn't spoken so much about in his obituaries and the tributes that came into him um was that i i he said he knew a lot about road cars he was interested in road cars, certainly interested enough to you know to have a chat about them. Because I, um, I went to his house once to discuss a thing we were working. Did on. you? It's a long time ago, and I went down there in a Rover seventy five press car. It wasn't my car before I'd got mine. And as I was leaving, he came out. But I remember he opened the front door, and he went, "How is it?" And I was a bit—I didn't know what he was talking about. And I went, "How? How's what?" And he went, "The car. How do you find it?" And he nodded at the Rover, and I said, "Oh, well, it's um." Yeah, I like it. And then he went, so that's the Rover. and But the MG one, have you driven that? And I <laughs> said, yeah, I have. And then we started talking about that, and then we got into a big chat. And he had, he did have an arrangement with BMW that I don't know, he got like discounted cars or free cars, I'm not sure. But he he had some very strong thoughts on M Sport versus SE spec suspension on BMWs. And he felt the M's had gone too hard. You know, remember sort of when you get, I think he had five series. I remember when they went too hard, he yeah. Said, and he was saying they're getting too hard. And he said, the next five series that I have, I'm going to order an SE because I'd like the softer suspension. I don't, I don't need that. And, you know, the handling isn't much different, I think, and all this. And he, yeah, he got some views and he knew all about, you know, the differences and things. And it was like, you know, shit, I didn't realise that Murray would be so into road cars as well as racing cars. So oh, that was another thing. Do you know what like, he owned? Like, over the years, or? well, he definitely just had BMs. I don't know. It's just a good point. I, 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 I'm not sure. Good question. If anybody it feels like someone who might have had, you know, sort of like a really tuned up Mini at some point. Oh yeah, he, him and Paddy Hockkirk will have had a few phone calls, won't they? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they will have done. And Paddy would have gone. Oh yeah, I can do a few bits for you. Don't don't yeah. don't, don't you worry about that. <laughs> you stick with me, Murray. I'll sort you out. And then you uh, do little. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> taking it for a drive and Murray's going well Paddy I'm not sure I can feel much difference low down oh my goodness and then it all kicks I'd off. like I'd like so you were a couple of podcasts ago you were you were you were getting stressed out about an MOT can you imagine it, it, l- l- latter years Murray could have done these um, commissionable MOT voiceovers perhaps um, <laughs> should have been really quite cool wouldn't it you can you can have your your failure ticket read out to you or or just um, in the moment of 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 what's happening but Murray's really making sure he keeps all the detail in headlight adjustment are they do they put the wipers and the washers on the horn do they do it all just really quickly just to get the job done have they put a plastic cover over the seat or are they just going to chance it because it's dark fabric you won't see a smear of hydraulic oil on there until you sit on there with your white Armani jeans on and then you get out of the car. <laughs> or you're a member of the Scorpions yeah. and you've got white Oh, of course. On. And then you're, you're going to sue the garage uh, for damages of 80s metaler clothes. Um, yeah, could, could be a thing, couldn't it? Bless Murray. Bless. Bless him. If anyone's listening top, that knows what Murray has driven and owned in the past, apart from borrowed BMWs, get in touch. I don't know why I'm just very, yeah. very keen to know. It's a good point, yeah. Do remember to entitle your email, I bought a V8 engined Westfield from Murray Walker in 1997. <laughs> with a one-wheel or trailer. Like that. I don't know, I'm speculating here. but um, <laughs> With a, with, with a uh, tip trailer. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, 
Oh, what yeah. else are we going to talk about? Oh, I, uh, do you know what? Something else I was going to bring up, what I meant to mention uh, last week, was have you seen those adverts for Confused, the car insurance people, the latest ones? They've binned off James Corden. Is this the Mercedes? That, that doesn't it, yeah, but it's still got a Merc. Have we talked about this? Don't think so. It's the one where it's like it's got a sort of... There's a, like a, a city street, but it's it's built inside a a, set. an old aircraft. And does it drive yeah, out a of a set and onto an open road? Mm. And doesn't is there a problem with the back suspension? Is that what you're? It looks like the dampers are fucked. Oh, I think, yeah. Have you noticed? Yeah, I totally, it's funny. God, we are so so sad, Rich. We need to just go <laughs> and go to Ibiza and party or something. Um, Do you think that would help? No, not right now. I think Ibiza is probably largely closed. Um, yeah, but even if it was still, if it was in full effect, we'd be standing on the terrace at space or something at seven a.m. Going, look, there's an original say at Marbella out there. Look at that. God, it's funny. Yes, yeah, it's, so, it's tragic. Um, in fact, someone got in contact with me help. recently to say they've got a say at Marbella in immaculate condition. Really? Yeah, and I was actually impressed. Yeah, things of. Were they selling it? Um, I don't think they were, but well, they, they um, were just showing off. I, th- I mean, they, they were a bit. Did they shit, not make it? They, they made a convertible one, though, didn't they? Well, they had the canvas roof like a panda. Yeah, did they ever have a full ca- cabrio? Uh, ooh, don't know. I know they had a canvas like a you know a, 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 just a soft roof yeah. that opened front and back. And I'll tell you how I know this because we went on a family holiday to Spain. When I Espanol. was about Espanol, uh, down to the Costa del Sol, when I was about 11 or 12. And we rented a say at Marbella with the fold back roof. And one of the, I think it had like rubber straps that, that held the roof back and open. And on the back half, the rubber strap had come off. And so they, oh, the hire company had bodged it with a load of wire. <laughs> and to open the roof, you had to unwind the wire and then wind it back to the lash <laughs> the roof open. And one day, <laughs> I, I clambered into the back seat of the Marbella to go somewhere, and the wire had somehow fallen off and was on the back seat and I put my hand down and the end of the wire which is quite sharp punctured my wrist oh, <laughs> your wrist <laughs> oh. yeah it really fucking hurt but mercifully I didn't bleed to death so I'd consider that that's um, good and it, a, a lucky escape and it hadn't been licked by foxes the night before <laughs> Or anything like that. No. Well, particularly in Spain. Did you? Oh, you didn't, because you, you didn't go on like family holidays abroad. I've never been abroad with my parents, Rich. Because if you had been, I guarantee that your parents, like my parents, like all parents in the sort of 80s, would have said, don't stroke any dogs or cats, rabies. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, don't, neither of my parents are from Essex. So, I was going to say, they would, yeah. But they, they didn't say And if like he that. was. But that was a definite parental thing. You know, there's sort of stray dog trotting down the street in Spain. Don't go if near your it. Dad, I have rabies. If your dad was from Essex in the 80s, if he, if you were of teenage years, if he took you to one side and whispered in your ear, don't go stroking the hounds, you'd think, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about, Dad. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, just between you and I. I won't stroke any hounds, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so I, my, I had my wrist... <laughs> my, my wrist punctured by um by by well not by a set Marbella per se but by a bodged repair by a hire company dodgy wo- dodgy dodgy cloth um badly fixed down roofs um which is not a support band for badly drawn boy um, <laughs> it's, um it's the well, no, Noel Gallagher's high sided vehicle. Oh yeah, well actually no no Gallagher's high sided vehicles. I it reminded me of um, a guy I used to know when I lived in London who was quite he lived a couple of streets away from me and he was into a lot of classic cars and ended up buying one off me. My he came to buy an Opal record off me, the one that had the, the mummified dog under it. And he ended up buying a my Australian Ford Fairlane that was parked outside the flat, wasn't even for sale. And he ended up badgering me and bought it. But the reason why I'm telling you this is because he, he once went on holiday in his bay window VW camper van and was driving across the Severn Bridge. And it had one of those plastic pop-top roofs, um, mm. which have, I think, four latches around them internally. And... 
it was quite windy and I think two of the four weren't maybe latched properly and the wind must have got un- underneath and it, it flipped it straight off. It took the whole white pop top off and it flew over into the water, never to be seen again. Shit. And he had to drive along the rest of the... Because you can't really stop on the bridge. But, of course, it had a full no. interior. So he said all the curtains, because of the wind, the, the, the such, <laughs> all the curtains just went vertical into the air. So it was driving along, like, with crazy hair that was just pattern curtains. Mm. And he said it, we, we, we were on holiday. So he said we had to, we had to camp for the rest of of the week with just um, taped together bin liners for a roof. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, God bless British holidays. Yeah. Awesome. I've just remembered, sorry, this is the total digression now, but I I remembered two other things about the Spanish holiday in which um, I punctured my wrist in the back of the set of my bear. (laughs) You sound like a druggie when you put it like that. I know, it's weird. Anyway... Uh, the other thing that happened was that uh, we, we were going somewhere one day. And you know things that you can just see in your mind's eye sort of forevermore? And this is one of them. There was a long straight, but it was uphill. And we were behind a lorry. And it was lumbering because it was uphill. And my dad decided to go for an ambitious overtaking manoeuvre. And... So he pulled out and it immediately became clear that this Marbella, which I guess probably had like about 40 horsepower, was struggling. And he banged it down a gear and it was just, the engine was getting a bit urgent sounding. (laughs) And my mum was not a nervous car passenger, I would say. She was generally, you know, pretty calm in the car and she was a good driver herself. But I just remember, my dad's name was Phil, and I just remember as we sort of were barely level with this lorry and it was obvious there was another lorry coming towards us downhill down this long straight i just remember my <laughs> mum turning to my dad just going fell in a sort of are you sure what are you going kind of to do voice? about this and she never normally did that and it made me i was like oh no this is a situation now I can tell already that this car has not got quite the power that it needs to execute this manoeuvre crisply. But the fact that my mum has now gone, Phil, is really worrying. Because that means she's worried, which means we should all be worried. And I think in the end he had to bail out of the manoeuvre and just tuck back in again. But it was a. I can still see this long, dusty straight stretching up into the mountains and a lorry coming towards us down it. That's one thing that happened. The second thing is we went to um, a little town somewhere up in the mountains, possibly at the end of this journey where we didn't get smushed by a lorry. And we were sitting in a cafe having some lunch or something when a load of Rover 800s went past. The Rover 800 had only just been launched. And it became clear as, as they sort of went slowly by that they had like extra instruments strapped to the dashboard and stuff like that. And they were test cars. It was obviously a, a rover engineering team doing some sort of slightly hot weather testing in southern Spain in the summer. And my excitement went off the scale. It was the highlight of the holiday, even though they weren't secret cars at that point because the 800 had come out. So this must have been about sort of like, I guess, 87. Um, I still was like, holy shit, they're actual car engineers with actual development cars passing by where I am this is the most exciting thing that's ever happened <laughs> couldn't tell you anything else about that holiday can't remember where we stayed presume we maybe went to a swimming pool or something can't remember I uh, but I saw some Rover 800s I had to sift through some physical photographs the other day I've got two boxes of them um, to mm. find a picture of my bubble car and um, God, I found some um, some gems when I used to go on holiday and I'd go to a nice country like Sardinia and I'd say 80% of the photos are ca- rusty cars that I found <laughs> next to a bunch of cacti on some wasteland. I mean, honestly, there's no, there's, there's just no rhyme or reason why I split it with my first girlfriend. Um, uh, um, <laughs> It'll probably remain a mystery. Yeah, a complete forever. mystery. And the way it was, I, I, looked, I looked at some of them and um, some of the cars that were left as dead or just some of the normal street furniture cars that were just a snippet in time then they soon become really fascinating don't they they soon become mm. brilliant there were so many renault fours about then there were so many um early fiats you know, like little first gen pandas and stuff oh it's great great to see that but 
Yeah, I, t- I took a lot of pictures of cars. I think it's it's clear. And I, I even took my camera to some scrapyards in the late 90s. <laughs> some amazing stuff in, in just pre-internet scrapyards. Because, of course, well, they couldn't... F- scrapyards here or scrapyards while you were on holiday? Uh, I've only ever done... I've only ever done one scrapyard on holiday, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I can't remember the excuse I gave... I've I've done a scrapyard whilst on a paid job actually once I was in I was driving from Bilbao top of Spain to Granada and um next to the motorway just looked this amazing looking scrapyard which was all Mercedes weirdly and I just had mm. to go and have a look so I quickly had to turn off and find the track to it and oh it was amazing This wasn't the trip the infamous trip where you and Wookie had to pretend that you were going into a nightclub but you oh weren't. no that was the that was uh, we were driving a Seat uh, Ibiza this one was driving an MX-5 in fact this one this story this was I was doing a, a job for we were producing Mazda's customer magazine at the time and they'd just done this new special edition of the MX-5 and I'd got the first one and my job was to drive it to Granada to the airport meet the photographer who was flying in and do these shots for their brochure in the in the hills and i was under specific instructions don't leave it parked anywhere dodgy don't damage it don't don't do anything because there isn't another one and we've got to get these shots and so what happened got it i got it all the way there absolutely flawlessly met the photographer at the airport we did a recce drove straight up into the mountains the day before and we got up there and he was looking taking some polaroids and stuff as you as they used to and he said oh can i have a drive I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And it, he's he's actually quite a good driver. However, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why you're laughing. However, he completely forgot that we were in a foreign country. And he just got oh. he got in this car in the, and went down the mountain road. So like a twisty, you know, helter-skelter style uh, mountain pass on the left. And I was in the passenger seat. This was a right-hand drive Mazda. And but just as I turned to him, went, "What are you doing?" Like going around this blind corner. This ah, oh, bless him. This old man who was a carpenter was driving up the hill in a Citroen BX with a stack of wood on the roof, and he, the Mazda, managed to react quite quickly and swerve. But I had my elbow on the door because um, yeah. it was a hot day, so the roof was down, and I just lifted my elbow at the way, and we just smashed the whole side, like from front to back, every single part of the left hand side of the car got smashed, and it tore, it tore the whole front off the Citroen. the The old man nearly had a heart attack, and the suspension malfunction on the BX went up to its highest setting, and then kept click clicking. Because I remember I had to go and <laughs> shut the BX off because I thought it was going to explode. Yeah, oh so it was. It was. As, <laughs> <laughs> that was. I. I don't know why, but I. That's the weirdest thing I've ever. And heard. I remember. I thought you were going to say it collapsed down onto its. No, it went stops, really it high went into like. <laughs> it went really high, like Toyota high, like high, and it just kept obviously reaching its its limit, and then and then resetting and going higher, trying to go higher. So I panicked, <laughs> and whilst the photographer who was an Aussie, I won't say his name, he tried to talk communicate to this poor guy who was just on his way back from from work who couldn't speak any english uh, mm. we couldn't speak any um spanish so it was all very confusing and quite stressful i was genuinely sweeping up pieces of white citroen bx because i think there's some composite panels on the front of it and that just re- it re- oh, oh, wrecked yeah. all of that it just turned into french confetti and i look back at the mx5 which i've been tasked with getting there immaculately and it was the whole side was trash rich. Honestly, it was. I've got photos. I took photos. That's why I'm having this conversation. So, for th- let me guess, did you then just take photos of the right side of the car for the entire shoot? Yep. Or was it yep. ruined? All, yeah, all, all rear, did. all all rear, all rear three quarter, or dead side on panning. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to drive it all the way back. And apart from the tracking being out, it still drove absolutely fine. The steering wheel was was sort of half cocked the wrong way, you know. And but of course everyone was staring at me because it was this brand on one side it was perfect and it was black as well it was jet black with chrome roll hoops and it had a couple of other uh, I, I can't remember the edition now but it was a special edition but yeah it got trashed fucking hell yeah weirdly I, well now you've said that the photographer was an Aussie I know that it's not the same photographer as the one I know who made the exact same mistake 
and set off in a in a country that drives on the right driving on the left because they were in a right-hand drive car so they just instinctively thought they were at home and came around a corner and basically had a head on oh. with a with a local couple in a a Peugeot and uh, wrote off one of the star cars from big group test oh sugar so that car was just removed from the group test. What, what was it not mentioned, or was it? It was just not. Yeah, it's just not mentioned. Really, just not. Yeah, it just got. It just got removed from it, oh. and it was never mentioned. And um, the I think they might have done some sort of pack shots with all of them, so they just redid the pack shots. To, that car wasn't. Oh in it no! At all. It was erased from history, effectively, all because the snapper had had a bit of a, a forgetful moment. No. Um, which is a nightmare. I was once on holiday. A big, a big group of us went on holiday. Like about eight of us, think went on holiday to France, and um, we had two hire cars. I think we had a Clio and a Megan. And for some reason, I was insured on the Megan, and my mate Andy was insured on the Clio. And one day, just the two of us went out. I don't know why. It was just one person in each car. We were doing some logistics or something, and. Andy pulled out of where we were staying first and set off at some lick but on the wrong side of the road and I was like oh fuck he's forgotten hasn't he so mm. so I started chasing him in the McGann flashing my lights and driving on the right the correct side of the road and trying to indicate to him to pull the fuck over to the correct side before someone came around a bend he thought I was trying to incite him to race oh. and was attempting some kind of saucy overtaking manoeuvre, which is why I was on the wrong side of the road. So he sped up. And it's it's a horrible feeling no. when you're like, my attempts to make this better are ironically making it worse. So um, it happens. If you again, It feels like there's some kind of low-quality radio show. I was going to say, if you've got an accidentally driving on the wrong side of the road anecdote, then please do get in touch. Okay, this is Tila <laughs> Now No, this is Captain of the Heart by Dublé. <laughs> <laughs> or is it double? I still don't know. I don't know. I think it, I, it's one of those songs that I... If, I were, if I'd ever written, which I wouldn't, um, Alan Partridge, I would have definitely had that as one of the interim tracks because I think Partridge would have definitely appreciated that yeah most definitely with the alto sax yeah loving it oh, oh I know I was going to oh go on sorry no. I think you've just remembered something that we were supposed to talk about and maybe I have as well you go you go first well I know what I was going to say is just there's a couple of new cars that have come out and one of them uh, is the Kia EV6 which I thought might have piqued your interest it was shown off last week, wasn't it? Yeah, I missed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you not seen it at no. all? No. Really? No, I'm just looking at it now. I'll be honest, I've been... Last week for me was just a dreadful week for productivity. Oh, hang on. No, I have seen... Um, yes, yes. It's a crossover. Got some very mad lighting going on at the rear that looks a little bit like a slightly sad face. Yeah, it's a bit dribbly, isn't it? It looks like it's leaking or something. The lights. I mean, that is quite. The, the body. Yeah, work. it's quite. What well, the front looks. Front looks like a VW Sirocco. Like a Dakar, a Dakar, oh, a Dakar yeah. version of VW Sirocco. Bloody hell! It does. Mm. You're right. I was trying to think because it's funny. I like it as an overall car. Of people who haven't seen this, it's like if if we talked a few weeks ago about the the Hyundai Isotonic Five, which is oh, their just pure electric car on a bespoke electric chassis and this is um is kia's answer uh yeah same box of parts but kia's put a different body on it and and um it i really like it to look at overall but at the same time i do find like the front is sort of oddly bland and the back is oddly odd the back the back as a whole i quite like it the back is um rave circa 1992 someone's definitely gone there with a box of pills and had a really fun time <laughs> it's almost like this it could be the sort of automotive reverse mullet couldn't it it would be oh well, it's business at the front and it is party at the rear that is a, that's a correct mullet so it's an it's an it's a high end <laughs> it's a mullet it's a mullet car the kia ev mullet well the kia yeah the kia moulet ev would be <laughs> completely. Are there any other mullet cars out there? The business um, at the front, party at the rear. 
I'm trying to think. I don't know. It's got I... to be. Oh, I know. Um, that Maserati 3200 GT with the boomerang rear lights. Oh, that's yeah. a bit. That's yeah. a bit moulet, isn't it? Mm, quite serious at the front, but then a bit zany. Auto, yeah, auto mallet. Auto mallet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I'm digging that. Yeah. Oh, hang on. What yeah. about? Oh no, because McLarens are quite extreme at the front and the back. I was thinking a speed tail's a bit out there at the rear, isn't it? It's a bit out there. But uh, then again. It is, but yeah. And the front is sort of looks a bit like some kind of um, bottom feeding fish. It does. Yeah. Yeah, very much. Does. The whole thing looks a bit a bit like a sort of something. If you were treading water in a very warm ocean and you look down and saw a McLaren <laughs> speed tail swimming beneath you, you'd probably be like, Whoa, hang on. Do they bite? <laughs> oh yeah. Quite weird looking. Oh yeah, you'd have um you'd have um Steve Backshall. Uh, but, uh, uh, St- Steve Backshaw, he'd, he'd, he'd elbow you out the way and dive straight in with his with his khaki shirt on, um, and he'd, but in a very whispering but authoritative and, and enthusiastic voice. I like Steve Backshaw; he's great. Have I ever um, told you about when I met Steve Backshaw? You, know, you, was... you haven't met Backshaw as well. I have. Oh, yeah, bastard. We, met we them all. I went to a book festival in Scotland, and he was um, he was you know speaking at it. And... Was he working working the doors? Working <laughs> no, he was on duty in case any animals came in that needed to be shooed away. That were oh, wrangled, yeah. wrangled. That's it. Wrangled is the word I'm looking for. So, um, yeah, I, I, and we were in this sort of backstage. Well, it was not backstage. Actually. It, was, it was a big old house um, that, uh, and we were sort of in, in like the, the, <laughs> Steve backstage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It never does front stage. Access Absolutely. all areas with Steve backstage. <laughs> I'm here at the Birmingham NEC where Bon Jovi are due to play in a few hours' time. But I'm just making sure there are no snakes because they're. <laughs> oh, because. Reports because. Of a bear uh, in yeah, the corridor. Bon, bon Jovi hates snakes. I mean, they like snake Absolutely. skin, but they don't do yeah. snakes. Ironically, the only band that hates snakes more than Bon Jovi is Poison. I um, thought it was white white snake. The oh, why? No, they love them, <laughs> or do they not? Is that the irony? They, um, oh yeah, they hate they're them. They're really squeamish around them. Yeah. Um, why, why are we talking about Steve <laughs> Bagshaw? I don't even know. Uh, oh fuck! I can't remember. I can't remember. Um, because of the Kia EV6. Oh, oh yes, it was the it was the bottom feeder, uh, shallow waters. Oh, oh yeah, that's yeah. That's if you right, see yeah. if you see a McLaren Speedtail in real life, do get Steve Bagshaw to come and. Can hook it out, <clears throat> hook it out. Yeah. He'll, well, he'll lure it over using the front end of one of the current Aston Martins, and it'll go. Ooh. <laughs> they look like they could sift krill, though, don't they? Sort of... Oh, oh, they are, they are, they are absolutely um, filtering the detritus to look for nutrients. They really are. I can't decide whether I like it. I just can't decide whether no. I like that, that at the Aston front. It's a bit too bottom feedy because the grill goes into nothing doesn't it it just goes into yeah there's no bottom chin there's no um well there is now on the vantage because they've they've realized that people weren't i would guess they've realized people weren't super keen on it necessarily and you can now order the vantage with a different grill you, which is it does a, it's have a, a bottom it's, chin so it's an optional grill which is very mm. odd isn't it i've mm. never known, known a car to have an optional grill well, it's a bit of an admission of fucking it up isn't it yeah you have to go it's it something that's a bit it's a bit less weird um i don't mind that vantage i thought it's okay i know what you mean it does it sort of feels like it might it, it might benefit from a bottom chin but maybe that would just make it look <laughs> more strange it's, because because to be honest i've a only ever seen chin. it in in pictures but the optional one is uh not quite right either it feels like it should be less reverse rake it sort of tucks under a bit and it looks strange in some angles i don't know I haven't seen one in real life, so I can't see. I can't say. I would, can't you own, see. Would, you, would, would you own an Aston Martin? Uh, that's funny. I was sort of thinking about that this morning. Um, and yes, I'd have a V12 Vantage of the old shape with the manual. Oh, box. gosh. It's exactly what you, we've had. I think we've had this conversation before. It's, the, it's totally my answer as well. Because weirdly, I, I remember doing my when I did the my, when I did my Top Gear audition in the studio, and mm. there was a there was a the new seven speed um, Aston there that they were talking about. I can't even remember which model it was because they all look the same to me. But um, the uh, they asked my opinion on it, 
and I said it to me it's a bit like a dog I love taking them out for a walk and I enjoy seeing other people have fun and get rewards from them but I don't want one in my house I don't want to live with one and that's the same yeah that's, I, think, that's, I think that's the way I am with with a lot of Astons I I remember I haven't driven the, the current V8 Vantage very much but I, I remember driving it having a go in it and thinking it's really good I really liked it it felt it felt good it felt like a good car and it felt sorted and it sort of it actually felt more sorted and more solid and more together than I expected and mm. I didn't particularly oddly although I love the V12 Vantage like it's one of my favourite cars of all time yeah I never much cared for the V8 Vantage I just somehow it didn't click with me the same I think and, well, the V12 Vantage was such a powerhouse mm, just felt really sort of dense didn't it? it's like yeah 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 it's, it's in the same way the 350z was its was its warm-up act i always thought <laughs> yeah, I, I, i'd forgotten that the 350z was quite good wasn't it it was a it really was physical mm. drive driving car and <clears throat> damn what a bargain now yeah i'd love some with the in, questionable caramel interior i really want one yeah i quite like the 370 as well which i think oddly you can still buy or you could until recently what yeah Shall I look on the Datsun website? Nissan website. <laughs> <laughs> look on the Datsun website. Shall, shall, I, shall I write to Datsun? Can you fax they Datsun? Can send me a break. Ask if they can. <laughs> <laughs> We've yeah, it's available um, by fax only because just of lockdown. Going to, uh, hang on, here we go. I, Come on, I'm they t- must have stopped until, 375 yeah, right, five no, years they, ago. No, they, it's not on their website anymore. Oh, or is it? Hang on, all passenger cars. Maybe there's. Don't one. suddenly tell me that you can. That you can no. buy right. a 370 right. just sort of through the back door it's a bit like did you know i mean they haven't been open since lockdown but did you know pizza express um yeah. you can buy something uh, one of the desserts which is colossal called chocolate double chocolate glory or something <laughs> chocolate glory right and it's a very very large vase of ice cream and chocolate <laughs> layers it's absolutely <laughs> massive <laughs> and the reason why i'm telling you this is because they took it they took it off the, they took it off the menu they took yeah. it off the menu really yeah. quietly mm. and i and i and my wife wants she never has one but one day she went oh i really fancy a chocolate glory but i can't manage it on my own would you help me i said well that they've been discontinued they're not on the menu anymore she went oh, i bet they are so she went over and asked and the waiter said he sort of came in a bit closer and he went well look we do still sell them but then you can ask for them but we don't advertise that we are and I, what what why what's what's happened is it sounds a bit all kind of contrabandy and he said well it's because of the calorific content i think um, um they can't they can't really advertise it because it's probably too bad for you is this like and with car makers have their sort of fleet emissions average yeah it's exactly so it's like that it's in exactly their interest like to that. bin off high emissions models if they can't be counted with low emissions ones so yeah this is like pizza express have gone <laughs> fuck bin off the chocolate explosion because it's making yeah. us look bad <laughs> it's exactly in other words that's why i would love it if if we all f- totally forgot but nissan do still still sell the 370z it's just it's only through the back door you've got to go to a certain dealership between certain hours and you've got to <laughs> shout a password <laughs> ask for terry yeah. yeah and they go oh yeah you clearly want a 350 hello sir how can i help you <clears throat> i'm after a micro but do you have one after a V6 Micra, yes, I can help you. <laughs> rear wheel drive? Do you have any yes, rear please. wheel drive <laughs> Micras? Why are you <laughs> winking, sir? Um, I, according to Wikipedia, the 370Z was uh, 2020 model year was the final model year for the 370Z. Oh gosh, so, so it was a lot. That it has ju- it's only just been well model year. So Suppose if that's American model year, that means it was stopped. Yeah, they stopped making it in 2016. But um, <laughs> someone after do Americans about do years, that with advent calendars? Yeah. <laughs> do, they, do you? Um, you, you, you go. Ah, oh, well, it's we've we're opening the 16th door, so it means it's Christmas Eve. And go. Well, hang on. How does that all work? No, it's too soon. Uh, somebody sent a message in after we talked about model years on a previous show and said that there's actual rules about this. And a model year cannot be declared before a certain date. And I'm, I'm afraid if, if it was you that wrote in, I, I'm so sorry. I, I thought your email was 
well, I assume it was factually correct. It certainly sound very well informed, and thank you for getting in touch. I've forgotten the information though, but I believe there were there were certain dates. They're not allowed to start calling something a new model year until a certain date. M Y in in the um, U S. Anyway, which I always um, thought was just my. But yeah, my my twenty one. Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know when they stopped making it. I'll, I'll probably have a look. But um, yeah, 370Z was available until weirdly recently. I do know that. Um, it's just emission scandal cars that you buy through the back door. Oh, wouldn't that be great if we just unlocked like a dark web of cars that are still available, but they shouldn't be, <laughs> and you're not supposed to talk about them? It's. I mean, I suppose it's... It, it, I was fascinated by cars like the 370Z because for... The last haven't, haven't seen one on the know, road in years. Three years at least of its existence on the price lists in the UK. How no, many did they sell? No, no one, no one cared about them because it I wasn't mean, promoted. No one, no. there was no publicity, no marketing. No, um, in, in even in even Infinity probably sold more, and mm, and that's well, not many, is it? <laughs> in the UK, anyway, not in the states. Infinity will sell well. But. Yeah different story here very different story a very different story it's very different di- story um, it's a very different story wait a second it's kind of it's just just bear with me because i've just seen something that implies that the 370z coupe is actually still on sale in the u.s oh piss off piss off piss off surely not i mean maybe there's maybe they might have stock left i don't know anyway it was um a quite a nice car but i was going to say about the v12 vantage the aston is that um what I liked about it is that feeling of sort of density to it. it was like, have you ever held a big snake and they're, and they're weirdly sturdy and stocky? You think because it's all muscle, there's no mm, flab. Yeah, there's you no think they're going to be sort of squishy and slimy, and they're neither of those things. They're stout. That's true, actually. I have. I've held several snakes, and <laughs> I, I don't know why that's funny. Uh, I, and I never posed for any kind of promotional photographs for as a metal a metaler or you know rocker. <laughs> um, but obviously, the snake was one of the most popular props. Um, mm. I, I no, I just. I, I remember them being very taut, and I remember them they because obviously they can do the equivalent of a sit up mm. for for minutes and minutes and minutes, can't they? Because they can just hold their weight, quite a lot of leverage. They can hold it out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they they're, I quite I quite like snakes. I, I mean, I wouldn't want one as a pet, but I don't. I'm not terrified of them or anything like that. Way more terrified of. Um, I don't know Bram Stoker's Dracula, for example. <laughs> <laughs> that popular domestic pet, Bram yeah. Stoker. Yeah, oh, do you know? I remember being Bram remember that? Stroker is an entirely different thing. <laughs> Brown Stroker's Dracula. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I do you remember that film called Maximum Overdrive with Emilio Estevez? About Vaguely. it was a bad eighties film from memory, and it was yeah. all about a couple of lorries that were possessed. And could oh. drive on their own okay. and just no, mow people no, I'm down. I'm thinking of something else. I think. And it and 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 I it was one of those films that I think came on once just before I was going to go to bed, and oh. I just thought, oh, what's this? This looks interesting. And it, and it wasn't very good, but I have seen it and I did <laughs> do remember it. But it's about I think they all they all take over a truck stop. There's no evidence to suggest that a film called Maximum Overdrive with Emilio Estevez in it would be not very good. I'm I'm quite shocked. Well, be shocked. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was e. Emilio Estevez's film that he did after that, which was called Be Shocked. It was all in capital. <laughs> <laughs> With, I think it had two exclamation marks coming to think of it. Emilio Estevez plays a man who's got permanently wet hands, who just goes around operating electrical equipment. And will, will he get... <laughs> flung across a room by a high voltage or not oh very much so and terrible at wiring but just tries it anyway usually shower fresh without a towel <laughs> um, we've all done it we've all done it you dive out the shower doorbell's gone uh, yeah um so the uh, here's here's the news the nissan 370z oh gosh we're still on that is yeah still listed on the nissan usa website can you still buy it? Under the headline, 50 years of exhilaration. Oh, my gosh. So why are they still selling it? There must still be enough people buying it because otherwise they oh, would yeah. have just wound up production. And I suppose is it, Americans have a great affection for the, for the Z 
for the Z Coops. Yeah. Z Coop. Uh, have a guess how much the basic 370Z would cost you in the United States in dollars. Oh, I bet it's not that much actually. Um, 35? 30,090 dollars. Really? Thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. What sort That's, of power is it? Three hundred. Um, it is. I can tell you. It's. Oh, well, it says up to three hundred and fifty. Oh, oh, that's weird, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's not a powerhouse, is it? Oh, three three two. It says here. Where they've got three 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 from. two, and there's more aftermarket forced induction kits than you can throw yeah, a but that's, shitty I mean, that's spatula quite, at. That's quite. Uh, it's decent, isn't it? I, I remember driving it and thinking it was, it's you know, peppy. I like um, the way it drove. I just thought it was a, it was a backward step looks wise. I thought the three really? fifty, yeah, the three fifty is just an icon, and I think the three fifty will be a classic. Whereas I don't think the three seventy will. Maybe, That's just yeah. my, it's my just my pr- prediction. You know, I like the um, the compactness. I like the way the three seventy is a bit shorter. Um, uh, that price on a three seventy set is it's about twenty one and a half grand in pounds, which is that's a lot of gosh, that's, that's a lot of that's grunty good. old fashioned sort of. Uh, it's good grunting, old driving. fashioned. And can you still buy it as a Manuel three pedal, or is that is that auto only? I wonder if it's US. Uh, spec. I don't know because I think they still Americans sometimes go a bit more into the stick they, shift, don't they? They, they, they do with import BMW stuff. M cars that were M fives were manual yeah. available in the US, or as we were saying the other week, with available manual transmission. Um, to, let me see. Yeah, manual, six-speed manual. Six-speed manual, seven-speed auto. The base We've actually model. done some real investigative journalism whilst being what, on air. For $33,820, so not a lot more. You can have the... Um, the <laughs> this is not a setup for, for to do a fucking catchphrase, but it's the 370Z Spoot. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a six-speed manual with a limited Spoot. slip diff and upgraded brakes. Oh, you do and it? Yeah, it's worth it for the slipper. Bloody hell, you would do that, wouldn't you? You just would, because it without with an open diff, I should think that would be a bit joyless. Oh um, well, I don't know about that, but yes, I mean, I take your point. It was, it, it, you might as well for the sake of well, three thousand dollars. But I mean, bloody hell, I'm well, just going to em- I'm going to emigrate to the states. Just think, buy one of those compilation of Def Leppard, pick a good road, done. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the other thing I was going to ask you to guess is, can you guess when? The three seventy Z was announced. Oh sugar. Um I'm trying to think when the three fifty was phased out. I'm going to say twenty eleven. The I could sound like some kind of clickbait website now. The answer will shock you. Two thousand and eight. Oh sugar. I know. It's amazing, isn't it? It's a twelve plum, it's, it's plum jam. design now. Twelve. Years. <laughs> wow, that is. That's that's as long as the Ford Ka. Yeah. Because that had a really long production run of twelve. I remember on the launch of the one that came out after it, that was Dogs Mess. I remember that <laughs> that came up, um, which had the most visible exhaust of any car of the modern time that wasn't a sports car. Yeah. <laughs> was it more visible? It, Do you remember just, the Alpha One Four Seven that had an incredibly visible back box that sort of <laughs> seemed to be too big for the hole that it had been put into yes i do remember that it just looked like it was a robot with a stiffy hiding behind the back bumper. it was ridiculous <laughs> just went, why did you just not think to redesign that's just that? really crap isn't it and i thought it's we'd got away from sloppy. all of that with the golf mark four where it was where it yeah. pioneered that sort of lovely flush rear valance with no visible pipes the only one with the visible pipes with the r32 and the um maybe the GTI and everything else just had no Vizzy pipes, which I yeah. liked. Yeah. No Vizzy pipes uh, supporting this <laughs> new act, breakthrough act. Um, <laughs> Playing tonight, no Vizzy pipes. Uh, since I was getting you to guess stuff, I thought I was walking down the street the other day and I thought I've got a good game I can play with Johnny on the podcast. Is I was oh, going to gosh. I was going to read out some words and you had to, had to guess whether each word was or wasn't a Citroen Saxo special edition. Oh, okay. I've got, I can I do like you, that. I can do a couple. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the first Sax. one is desire. Was that or was that not a Saxo special edition? Oh, that was real. That was definitely a Citroen of um, des- spec. I'm, I'm going to say yes. Very good. Um, it's a song by U2, isn't it? That's all I would sing if I drove that. Yeah. Uh, Lake House. 
lake house uh, that's a bit like you know like great wall being a car company it's just words that don't mean anything with cars. i'd say no bing correct that's not okay cool oh, um, do i win money or no <laughs> it's just okay. it's just for the shits and giggles uh <clears throat> the next one top hat top hat top hat and see this is a trick one it feels tricky like you may be trying to throw me off the scent i'm gonna say f- false it's not real bing shit you're good at this okay um all right west coast was that a saxo special edition or not yes yes ding. It was. <laughs> uh, <sighs> and finally pomplamoose <laughs> um i'm gonna say no it wasn't no <laughs> oh okay <laughs> it wasn't at all <laughs> Well, but did they it's make the French a word for grapefruits? But did they make a Vauxhall Nova banditry? I believe they probably did. Yeah, yeah. yeah it Actually, was. Good. It was the one next to Sting. It was either the Sting or the banditry. You had the choice. I, I just remembered this. It was something I thought of the other day and forgot to write down. But I remembered it earlier on uh, because you were talking about MX fives, and the MX five, I think, is one of the few cars that runs the Saxo close for number of special editions along with I think the Nova you probably and the Corsa oh, and yeah. the the one that I um I was going to put this in one of my boring car trivia books and I never got around to finishing the list but the the old mini the old Rover mini I think dwarfs all of them the number of special editions of that car is oh checkmate mayfair yeah. Bla- uh, was it jet black red yeah, hot red hot equinox um, rotten a pillar uh, yeah a one. <laughs> crusty cells yes yeah, gonna say um trying to think can't fit anything in the boot that mot a good failure one. that was a good one a- yeah mott mott failed mott yeah. failed <laughs> <laughs> at four years old um yeah <laughs> sprite that was a real one wasn't well, it? Sprite was the limited edition that became a, a member of the range later on as a permanent fixture. Oh, bloody if hell, gonna, Rich. If you're going to fully push your glasses up your nose. Um, yeah, so... What um, bad... W- w- there are some s- sort of bad editions, stickers and nothing more, that kind of appeal these days, aren't there? Was it the golf match? You used to get the golf match. Yeah. And the early golf matches, I think, had black and white kind of net- netting effect seat fabric that are like a tennis uh, net. I Did think. they? Yeah, the Mark IIs from memory. I mean, maybe I've just fabricated that last bit, I'm sure. And they were often white. Uh, or maybe they were only white, the matches, I can't quite remember. But yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's some additions, isn't it? You've got the Roland Garros 205s. They were quite cool with the, I think the fabric inside was quite funky. Yeah. Yeah, this Y10 Lancia with the feeler interior. Still a cool thing. I've still never, <clears throat> seen, I've only ever seen one of them. They've all dissolved. That, there's probably one in Sardinia that I took a photo of in 1997. <laughs> oh, <I> but, certainly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and a Panda Italia 90, if you're lucky. Oh, footballing, footballing edition cars. Yeah, yeah, footballing edition cars. Uh, Pavarotti stuck permanently on the cassette player. Yeah. That was, I heard that That's song awesome. the other day. It's actually really good. That was the best part of Italia 90 from the <laughs> <laughs> it was Pavarotti doing that emotional song that I can't remember the name of. Nessam Dorma. Yeah, that was a special edition car. Um, I'm trying to think what car it was. You joke, but um, Nissan in the UK were going to do a official camper van conversion on one of their vans, the NB200, <laughs> I guess. Um, a Dorma, a Dorma bill. And Yeah, so someone at Nissan UK said, hey, we should call it the Nissan Dorma as a joke and they were going to go through with it until an Italian speaker in their office went you know that means none shall sleep and that's not a really good name for a a van (laughs) bloody hell Rich that's the best piece of trivia you've ever furnished me with Um, it's really good well I've got another one coming up um, at the end of the show which uh, speaking of which should probably be sort of about now I suppose Um, no probably gone on for got way more wind in the sails yeah I don't believe that 
<laughs> uh, I have three things to tell you. They are one, Johnny has a solo YouTube channel. It's called The Late Break Show, full of excellent videos updated at least weekly. Uh, two, I've got various books out. One of them is called Boring Car Trivia Volume 2 by Sniff Petrol. It's available exclusively on Amazon as a paperback or an ebook. And three, uh, many celebrities have owned original minis, but one that you may not know about is Clint Eastwood. I can't see Clint in a mini. Clint Eastwood had a Morris Mini Countryman. Did with, he? With some spanky tuning bits on it, some Cooper. Oh, was it, a, it wasn't a Radford or something, was it? No, no, I think it was just, but it was full, you know, the wood trim on the back, all that malarkey. There are pictures of him driving it. It's not, uh, it's not just a... That's bloody a brilliant. Mini. Clint had a Mini, so there you go. That's um, I like that, that's cool. Well, thank you very much. And we'll do this all again same time next week. Until then, thank you ever so much for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.